Hello, everyone, and welcome to, today, to today's webinar. My name is Deanne Ryder, and I'm the SEG Webinar Coordinator, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I will first cover a few logistics before Benedict begins. Today's webinar is going to be listen only. If you want to ask a question, we encourage you encourage asking questions throughout the webinar. You can do so by using the Q&A button in the control bar that should appear either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on your setup. Questions on the presentation will be answered during one of the two question and answer sessions during today's presentation. Today's webinar is a continuation of an earlier series targeting the needs of students and early career professionals. The webinar is being recorded and an archive will be available following the event. And if you've missed one of the previous webinars, I encourage you to look at the SEG website or our YouTube channel for that archive. And we wanted to take a quick poll to see who is joining us today. So let me just start that. And then I'll give it a few, um, few seconds here. And if you can respond, what's your experience level and whether or not you're an SEG member. And then I'll give it just a little bit because there's still responses coming in from everyone. And I see there's still a few, few people joining us, so I'll give it just another few seconds. Okay, looks like things are slowing down. So let's just, I'll end the poll and then share the results. So you can see that we have uh, quite a few professionals and individuals who are students or early in career and um, a lot of SEG members, but also some non-members out there. So welcome everyone, we're glad to have you. And then with that, I will introduce today's speaker, Benedict Steiner from Camborn School of Mines and Explore Global. He'll be presenting on the, he'll be presenting to, today, great, on Logistics Explained Planning and Exploration Program. Benedict? Thank you very much, Deanne, and uh, thank you to SEG for having me again to deliver a webinar as part of this series here. In fact, uh, this webinar topic is a direct result of uh, some of the feedback um, we gathered last year after the uh, webinars that I held. And some people commented on more, top, more practical topics, for example, logistics being explained in a bit more detail. So, yep, that's where we are. Um, so today, before we have another poll, I just quickly wanted to introduce uh, the topic. We'll be talking about the role of uh, logistics in exploration. And as part of this, I will present a number of macro logistical considerations. So aspects that you need to look into before you enter a new country or a new project. And I will also present micro logistical considerations. So some aspects that you need to look into once you establish camp and uh, um, continue to run your operations on site. You will get uh, a few examples from operating in different environments. I will present examples from South America, from Africa and from Russia. And by the end of uh, the webinar, I'll also have uh, a few simple project management tools that you may use to fast track and organize your uh, project a bit better. Good, so uh, at the end, I think we've got another um, poll coming up. 
And the poll is about um, a simple question. Are you planning to or currently undertaking field operations? That uh, should be quite an interesting one given the global situation. So are you in the field or um, are you currently not able to? Let's take a look. I think the end we are there. I think that's that's okay. Good. So I think there's clearly a, there's clearly a, a, a yes here. People are planning and undertaking field operations. 61%. I am very glad to hear it that uh, most of you are out there again and um, hopefully getting some good results from your exploration or mining campaigns. So that's that's great to see. Thank you for uh, responding. And let me quickly switch this off. Yeah, let's move on. So um, let me pick up on this uh, topic that I just mentioned, the role of logistics and exploration. Well, most of you who are out there in the field, you, um, you know that it is, uh, logistics is part of every day's job. It um, sometimes makes up more than 50% of your working time in the field when you have to organize uh, procurement or keeping an operation running smoothly. So um, once you're out in the field already collecting your rock or drilling, then I think the biggest job is already done because the biggest challenge is to um, get access to a remote area and to um, keep an operation running smoothly. Um, I found actually that uh, whilst this is a very important topic of every economic geologist's career, that there's actually hardly any learning material out there that covers anything like uh, exploration logistics. So I guess um, we can make a start right here. You will um, find that a uh, well-planned logistics program will enable your sampling or your field work and drilling to run very smoothly on budget and in time. And I've highlighted budget and time because it's quite common that projects run over time and it will have a significant knock-on effect, your, um, your budget and your planning and your logistics and the whole tale that's following. So whilst you as an economic geologist, you may not directly be involved in detailed logistics, and by that I mean uh, ordering equipment or ordering um, items and spare parts, it is nevertheless very important um, to be aware of these logistical aspects. Because if you're supervising a project and you're dealing with logistics people, then um, it's good to be aware and to be able to keep the team together and steer the logistics support people into the right direction. So let's start off with um, a number of macro logistical considerations. And by that, I mean uh, considerations that you need to take into account when you are at the planning stage, when you're perhaps in the office and you have a new project to run and uh, you do a desktop study, not just checking out the geology, but also what the logistics are that you need to uh, um, look into. And first of all, will be uh, geographical factors. Uh, so where your project is. Your project could be located in all sorts of different climates. It could be in a jungle and Amazonas basin. It could be in an African desert. It could be in um, high mountains in the Andes or in some other very remote place uh, uh, in Asia, for example. So access to most of these remote projects will be the key critical factor that you need to assess and uh, evaluate. I will talk about this access aspect a bit later on. Now, the geography also will dictate the proximity to any towns. And uh, towns are very important in exploration logistics because they can offer you a number of advantages such as access to workforce, 
access to a, a base, access to better supply chains that can speed um, things up. So if you take a look at this photo on the left hand side, that's uh, my colleague in Argentina who is uh, carrying out field work. You can see it's pretty um, remote terrain. Um, it's, um, the area is higher than 4,000 meters above sea level and it's about 100 kilometers away from the next larger town. And whilst 100 kilometers doesn't sound a lot, in the Andes it's actually uh, quite, a, quite a deal. It takes at least a day to get access to this area because it's so mountainous and the uh, roads are quite rudimentary. Uh, the next point you should assess are political and economical factors. Um, it's the classic question whether you are operating in a stable or an instable government, or in other words, in problem countries. Um, if you work in North America or in Australia, you have probably a pretty cruisy life. Um, everything is there for you. You can pick up the phone, make an order, and uh, everything works. But um, there are also other parts of the world which are uh, less stable, less uh, um, organized, if you like. And uh, that can result in a whole lot of logistical challenges. Um, in, in that respect, talking about politics and economy, maybe you should also consider the mining and mineral laws, or in other words, the mining code. This will define how you can actually obtain exploration or mining licenses. And uh, that's different from country to country. Um, and it will also have an impact on uh, taxation that's perhaps more important in advanced projects where um, we talk about uh, mining leases and any uh, kind of royalties payments. But perhaps the most important aspect here in this category are import-export regulations. Um, this can be quite a substantial problem. Um, I mentioned earlier, if you're, for example, working in Australia, you pick up the phone and you make a next day delivery order, that will not work everywhere. And if you are in a remote country that doesn't have a proper supply chain established, and the regional supply hub is, for example, elsewhere in another neighboring country, then uh, import-export regulations uh, are significant. So if you import gear or if you import any capital investment, such as vehicles or cars, you have to pay tax on top, import taxes and, and, uh, uh, and other taxes and, and costs. And that can sometimes make up up to 40% of the actual value of, of a vehicle, for example. So that stretches your budget instantly. So you need to come up with ideas how to reduce and how to streamline import-export regulations. I've worked on a project where um, there was an entire group of logistics and import-export specialists on that project that only dealt with getting things in and out of the country. Um, Communities, I mentioned this during one of my previous webinars, but um, again, I would like to emphasize how important um, communities actually are and how important as the skill is to, for you as an economic geologist, to be able to deal with communities, with public relations, with um, having community meetings and uh, trying to find common ground between what your company wants and what the community wants. In the photo on the left, you can see a colleague of mine. We were both working some time ago in Sierra Leone, and he ran uh, numerous uh, community engagements and meetings with, with uh, village elders and village chiefs. And it was a very important part of almost everyday work. Um, employment laws and regulations is uh, an important factor, especially if you want to hire local people. I talk a bit more about this in another slide. Cultural heritage. Um, maybe some of you have um, heard the news a few months ago that an Australian company was blasting or drilling on an Aboriginal graveyard site. 
now that hit the news in a negative uh, in a negative manner. Um, I'm not commenting that any further, but it shows that um, being able to uh, understand what drives a community, what drives the cultural setup and um, the habits of a community is extremely important. Um, religion and language also play a, a big role, of course, and that is particularly important if you're working in multinational, multicultural uh, teams where language barriers or religious barriers might be a problem. So if you're part of a team or if you're managing a team, um, this is uh, an important skill to have to be able to um, get everyone working together in unison. Now, of course, I know it's easier said than done, but I would like to make you aware of this aspect that's also part of organizing a smooth um, operation on site. And the last point on this slide here is the health and safety of a country. Um, in, in an initial desktop study, you may want to screen the general safety of a country. Is it safe to operate there? Um, what is the nature and the competence of the police force or military? So in other words, is the police your friend and helper or um, can the police actually cause problems? Um, I mean, it's common knowledge that in some countries, uh, the police extracts bribes from, from people and mining companies. But um, yeah, I think that's a, an aspect that needs to be talked about and an aspect that uh, you need to deal with and know how to deal with when you enter into a new country. Um, health and safety risks should be assessed as part of a risk assessment. And you need to also look into, before you even go into the field, what the availability of medical care is. And I'm mentioning this because it has been identified that the delayed access to medical care is a critical, um, a critical risk and it can lead to fatalities. So um, people dying. Now, um, if you work in a remote area and, and the next hospital or health station or center is more than 100 kilometers away and you have a, someone has a heart attack, then it might be too late until you arrive at a hospital. For that reason, do your job and um, check out before you go into the field um, where are the um, next and the, 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 the nearest health um, uh, centers and what do they actually, what can they do, what are their capabilities. Environmental regulations in the health and safety and environment aspect are also an, an, an important point to consider as um, those will dictate often how your exploration license uh, can be granted. There are sometimes uh, depending on the country, of course, a prerequisite. So you need to con compile a, an environmental impact statement, not an assessment, but a statement um, declaring what your work, what sort of impacts your work will have on the, on the environment and how that can be mitigated. Let me come back to the topic of access. Uh, I mentioned this earlier that access is one of the biggest problems um, that you can face in exploration. And <clears throat> as part of your desktop study and preparation study, you should assess the access either in and out of a country or in and out of a project or movement within a country. You also need to check the availability of vehicles, helicopters, excavators, and tanks. Um, it depends on the on the geography and the environment you're working in, but um, some of these vehicles are uh, needed. You can see on the right-hand side, a big Ural truck in Russia that got stuck in a mud pit. Now you just take a look at these tractor tires and even with that sort of uh, um, horsepower, um, that truck got stuck for about three days and the geologists and people there, they've uh, cut down trees to get this truck out of the, um, out of the mud. 
So there was no other help available. And I'm very sure that most of you who uh, work out in the field, you got your car stuck a couple of times. I did it myself, but knowing how to extract a, per, uh, a person in a, in a vehicle out of a, a precarious situation is important. Actually, on some of my field trips, I uh, practice such an exercise and um, ask people to think about how to get a car out of, uh, of such a situation. And that's a, a very important skill that um, you should have as a geologist. Um, on a similar note, road and drill pad constructions are required um, when you uh, access remote areas. Take a look at this um, photo there. That's just a good old Russian tiger with uh, swamps and uh, birch trees. Um, if you have to cut through, uh, and if you produce a number of roads, it of course needs permits that you need to obtain either from the government or from a community. Um, so being aware that this needs to be done before you even go and construct the road is, uh, is um, essential. So this slide here might look a bit busy, but consider it as a, as a tick box list that you may use later on to um, when you're planning or when you're setting up camp to tick the, the different aspects that are often required for camp or an accommodation base. You need to ask yourself, uh, first of all, uh, when you assessed all the different points that I mentioned before and you're in a country, you need to assess, do you actually need a camp or can you be based outside and um, somewhere in a, in a nearby town? Um, I mentioned the advantages of this earlier, namely um, having access to easier supply chains and um, perhaps local workforce. Uh, but sometimes that's not possible. You have to set up a camp in a remote location. And for that, you need to consider a number of specific aspects. Um, for a camp, you need, for example, business facilities. That means, uh, this means a place where uh, people can work, where you can, um, where you have electricity, you have a printer, people can connect their laptops with possibly some satellite internet. Um, you need storage facilities where you store supplies and um, gear and other equipment. You need sewage facilities, so um, ablution facilities in other words, and you need to ensure that the sewage facilities do not interfere with personal hygiene and um, uh, preparation of food, so the kitchens. Um, so that needs to be carefully planned to avoid any diseases and illnesses in camp. You need to have a service area where you, for example, fix and service equipment or cars or any other sort of um, vehicles. You need a working area, perhaps a core shed or a sampling shed where geologists lock core, where they um, uh, dispatch uh, or prepare and dispatch samples. You need a feeding area and well that sounds a bit like a farm to be honest but sometimes camps are farms where um, you have to feed many people. Yeah? Um, a camp can range from a handful of people to 50 or 100 people depending on the size of your project. So you need to uh, ensure the food and water supplies, it's a point further down the list. And I'm mentioning this because I've once been on a, on a project where we had many dozens of um, people working on this project and the, the food situation was quite poor. There wasn't enough food for all of these people. And um, if you were at the end of the, of the line, then you didn't get any food in the evening, right? Or just a few single French fries. So that, you can imagine, led to um, a deja vu of the French Revolution. And uh, you want to avoid such situations in your camp and therefore ensure that the, that the, the, the food supplies and the water supplies are all uh, 
running and um, operational. You should decide on your accommodation type, so whether you uh, need any tents or whether you have prefab containers or um, you live in houses. You need to decide on the communication system, so do you have a landline available that you just pick up and call someone, or do you have signal for your cell phones, or do you need to use VHF two-way walkie-talkies, do you need to have um, a mast, install a mast in your area to improve the signal over long distances or do you need set phones and what are the cost of the set phones per minute i can give you another anecdote here i was in the field with uh, uh, colleagues and uh, one colleague used to uh, call home every day for 30 minutes not knowing that uh, one minute on that set phone was about 10 us dollars so after a couple of weeks, that cost was just exploding exponentially. And uh, that sort of ate away a big chunk of the budget. So um, yeah, that sort of needs to be assessed and communicated clearly to the team what communication options are available. And I fully appreciate this, that communication is essential in our remote, a remote site because you want to be in touch with family, friends, and colleagues, and uh, other people. So, um, yeah, that's something that needs to be fixed. Uh, power supply. Um, well, without power supply, you cannot uh, drive the most basic necessities. So, uh, you need to assess what the supplies will be like. Do you just switch on a socket, or do you need a generator? What kind of generator do you need? Um, is that generator available in that country and at the time you need it? What are the cost for it? Or, and what um, is the reliability situation? So um, do these generators break down every couple of weeks and how long does it take to fix them? So if you have only one generator on site and that one breaks down, then you run into a number of issues. Um, and last but not least, what drives the world these days um, is a bulletproof COVID-19 setup. Um, I think everyone across the world has experienced the same issues and the same measures that are um, being introduced, maybe some more than others, but uh, they are pretty similar in terms of social distancing and different rotations of your, um, of your workforce. I'll talk a bit more about this uh, on, in a later slide, but I wanted to mention that here, that um, you need to understand what exactly needs to be made bulletproof in your camp. And that depends on your individual situation, of course. Maybe you have seen um, some of these photos in an earlier webinar. Um, I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of how these camps can look like. That is a classic African fly camp. So what is a fly camp? That's a, a camp that is in existence perhaps for a couple of days at most at a time. And that's used if you need to be mobile and need to cover long distances. So in this case, we went out in Central Africa and did some mapping. Well, only if there was an outcrop in this bush, but uh, yeah, we did it anyway. And um, the best logistical solution for this undertaking was to pack up two Land Cruiser trucks with all the required gear and base ourselves at important geological um, features or locations and from there on map around the area and once we were finished we moved on. Now that camp looks extremely basic but we still managed to put on a, a basic office and that office on the right, you can see we generated the, the electricity or we obtained it from the vehicle batteries. So it somewhat worked. We could still work our GIS and other software programs to uh, feed our GPS data into. And of course, camps, they may have an appearance of a bit of campfire romantics. You can see down there these two photos, um, you know, good, good old steaks being uh, prepared for on evening dinner and sitting around the campfire. But I promise you that if you do that for two weeks, 
you're longing back to be in a, a normal base uh, with uh, reg uh, with regular showers and a proper bed to sleep in. Um, and that is what um, is illustrated in this photo here. It's a remote camp that's in or that's in operation for I don't know a field season, a couple of months time, and you know you're going to spend there a, long, a longer time than in the fly camp. So you can see this camp is very neat. It's got um, proper tents with mattresses and health and safety gear. And what you don't see is in the background are um, office complexes and kitchens and so on. And usually that is being built by um, former army personnel. Uh, they've been doing logistics all their careers, and that's why this camp here looks extremely nice and neat and comfortable. So, um, yeah, that's just an example for a longer operation, but this may really depend where you are based. You may have um, temporary prefab containers that uh, offer more facilities. So, yeah, um, it's quite variable. Uh, let's move on to what else you need in a uh, project base. So uh, vehicles, of course, I mentioned all the special purpose vehicles. You can see again from Russia, um, uh, amphibious and amphibious vehicles, they can drive through these swamps and uh, forests in the taiga. Um, on that right-hand side, you might be, you may believe that um, that's a Russian pencil unit at the border, but actually it's not. It's just standard outfit of a Russian exploration campaign. I very much like that tank there on the right-hand side because it's got a drill rig on the back. You can see that in yellow, and um, you can literally drill. You can drive and drill everywhere you want. I was told that this tank is about 15,000 US dollars, so cheaper than a normal average car, if you like. So, um, yeah, if you have the budget, you can equip your project with a couple of these tanks. In terms of staffing, now the examples I'm giving you here, they are um, how projects can look like with major multinational companies. Not every company will have the luxury of um, providing so many staff on um, on exploration projects. I guess it depends on the size of your project. If you're only doing mapping, you don't need a full um, section of op um, operations and ge geology people. But anyway, um, an ideal staffing could look like you have a, a geoscience manager, if your project and graduate geologists, may, most of you probably um, fill these roles that I'm just talking about. You um, need operations people, such as a manager who's looking after several projects, um, an officer who's uh, running the camp, and perhaps some assistants. Uh, you, of course, need your health and safety representatives and also paramedics. Paramedics, in fact, have um, have proven to be extremely valuable on site as they can deal with any sort of uh, medical emergency and they are trained in uh, emergency evacuation procedures, especially if there's an issue with delayed access to medical care, something I mentioned earlier. Um, however, if your camp is healthy and safe and nothing is happening, these paramedics will uh, just sit in their tents and watch videos. So um, it's good to include them in your activities and keep them busy. One point I wanted to make about the local workforce that I referred to earlier on uh, was about the availability and uh, uh, cost of local staff. Now, what I'm saying now might sound a bit paradox, but you need to double check what the average cost of um, casual laborers on your uh, project in this area actually is. And why am I, am I saying this? Because if you overpay local laborers significantly, then it actually might have a negative um, impact on the community relations as everyone wants suddenly to work for your company, but you can't employ 200 people. So there will be conflict. So very important to double check 
what is the average national salary for a certain job role and adjust it. Now, don't get me wrong. Of course, I'm saying that um, employees need to be paid well. It's just that it needs to be carefully assessed how much you want to overpay um, your, your workers. And of course, all of this on this slide needs to be managed by someone, um, the local workforce, your technical people and the contractors. And I suggest that before you even start a project, you run a comprehensive training session on the jobs and the tasks that your team has to undertake. So last point before we have a break for Q&A session, um, I wanted to drill a bit more into detail what supplies you actually need for drilling. The list is, believe me, endless, but I give you a couple of pointers here. Apart from your drilling equipment, so the actual drill rig, you need um, spare parts and many spare parts, especially if you're on a remote site. It's often not possible to just uh, phone in and request a next day Amazon delivery. Um, often, as I said, your regional hubs are quite far away and maybe in another country and it can take weeks or months to get critical spare parts. You need support vehicles that can actually um, drive in the terrain that you're um, operating in. You need water pumps, basins, pipes, hydraulic pipes and water pipes. You need shelter for cold climate. So in the Northern Hemisphere, they're usually using these uh, square box uh, uh, prefab tents that um, shelter the rig from the, um, from the weather. And you need consumables. In particular, you need Water supplies, a diamond rig usually takes and uses 10,000 liters of water a day. Even if you um, have a water recycling system uh, present on your drill site. So if you're operating in the desert, where exactly are you getting 10,000 liters of water from? Right, that's a question you need to ask yourself beforehand and plan for it. And of course, um, uh, drilling requires lots of fuel. Just take a look at this at, the, at these um, fuel drums on this barge in this photo. Um, that's actually quite <laughs> um, not enough for a bit of drilling, but it's just uh, probably useful for fueling up your 4x4 vehicles. Um, so think about these aspects here when you're looking into uh, planning such a detailed uh, exploration or drilling campaign. Good, so I think we've got a question and answer session coming up and uh, I hope you have all asked for some questions. I think, no, there are no open questions. That seems to be, yep, that's interesting. So if you have any questions further on, please uh, use the Q&A um, function below. Good, I guess then we can uh, carry on. Okay, um, so to summarize what we just talked about, um, I, I presented the macro and micro logistical consideration of a exploration or drilling project. And now I would like to show a few um, photos and a, an example from some very difficult, challenging area in Central Africa where we operated um, a project in the past. Um, so it was Orogeny Gold Exploration. And um, let me just give you a bit of a, a feeling for how it was to operate in this particular area. Um, of course, operating in a jungle environment is challenging because you have issues with access. It's heavily forested. It's remote, miles away from any 
uh, village or any town. So what was required was uh, um, that road and drill pads had to be constructed leading to disturbance, of course. It was so remote that all the equipment had to be carried up in rucksacks um, to the exploration site and the drill rig also um, had, we had to choose an, uh, an operator that offered uh, drill rigs that could be dismantled and carried by hand. So um, it's not a classic drill rig that is wheeled or tracked. Um, it was something that man and man and woman had to carry out um, into the bush. So uh, getting a, a contract that offers that service is also not that easy. Um, at some point, we engaged uh, helicopters for exploration, um, as it was just so remote that um, all this equipment had to be um, choppered in. The accommodation, as you can imagine, in this sort of terrain was very basic in single man tents. Um, with a, a basic choice of food. So there wasn't any menu of the sort. It was uh, pretty uh, slim, just your uh, goat and your vegetables. And you can imagine all of this led to very long supply distances. I can recall that um, one of my colleagues once did a calculation how much it was to import a simple chocolate cookie from South Africa to this place. And I think the actual price multiplied multiply, multiply by 300%. So you can just see how much of an impact um, long supply distances and remote projects have on, a, um, on, on your budget. Of course, there were also a number of security issues and adverse politics. I don't want to really to elaborate on these ones in detail now, but um, uh, sometimes it's required to, um, or you're required to organize security guards that make sure that nothing is actually happening to your equipment or to your workforce. So um, I guess these challenging environments, they really build characters and um, if you have a chance to ever work on such a remote project, I highly, highly recommend that you take up the challenge and uh, this will really um, help you to build not only your geological skills, but also your logistical and your interpersonal skills. So to summarize this, operating in environments across the world. And we've seen examples such as jungles, deserts, high mountains, or Arctic permafrost. That is all very challenging and it requires an in-depth planning or pre-planning, organization and execution of a well thought out and supported logistics program. Some projects require more logistics than others. And it means that on some projects, you have to spend a lot more time on health and safety and on uh, logistics. And with others, where it's reasonably straightforward, just out of town somewhere, it's um, reasonably simple. So apart from all of these logistical requirements that I sort of um, described and explained earlier on, what sort of other um, issues should you consider on what project management tools should you adopt? Well, first of all, um, topic number one in 2020, as we all know, COVID-19, it has had a huge impact, not only on how we do work and how we um, run our field campaigns, but it has also a massive impact on our actual ability to carry it out in terms of um, uh, projects being uh, closed and so on. Before I dive into the slide, we have another poll set up. And Diane, if you could uh, just pop that up. I would just like to ask um, the participants how seriously uh, COVID-19 has affected your work and your career to date. 
So has it affected you at all? Or um, are, you, are you very affected by, by COVID-19 in a way that your project has been closed and you are unsure about your future on this project? So um, I'm keen to, to get your views at this very point in August 2020. Can wait for a few more seconds. I guess that's uh, that's where we're getting at. Yeah, thank you very much, Diane. Um, okay, I, I'm, I think you can all see the, the outcomes of this poll. It is, I have to say, quite a, a concerning statistics we're getting here. Um, so we have two, two people answering they have, haven't been affected about, um, Seven people, seven percent, um, not affected. A few neutral, but then the bulk of the people, forty participants, have said they have been somewhat affected, and forty-four percent have been very affected. Um, perhaps it's a good point to actually compare the stats to the stats that uh, Hitzman et al. have published on the SEG newsletter. Uh, just recently, it's an open access paper that um, you should probably have received through your um, regular SEG newsletter. I've, uh, I recommend you uh, take a look at this because it captures the COVID-19 employability situation. I think it was in late April 2020, and it was somewhat different to what we, we're seeing here because uh, many people seem to be affected by it. So um, thank you very much for, for uh, answering this poll. Let us uh, move ahead with uh, what I wanted to say about COVID-19. I mentioned it earlier that all across the world we've been affected by a similar issue. And we all ha had to adapt to new working routines. And I guess it started off with simple things such as communications. Last year, I don't know how many people used Zoom or Microsoft Teams. That seems to be one of the common toolkits available around now, everyone using these. Um, that's just one example. But um, before we consider of yeah, implementing anything on a project, I personally feel that um, a company or project should establish values and a vision. It's almost like with health and safety where you as a project or a company want to come up with how this crisis needs to be tackled and what it means for your project or for your company. That should be at the heart of this entire consideration, because if you can convince people to uh, follow your values and your vision, then half of the problem is probably already eliminated. So you need to define the uh, principles and responsibilities within your project or within the company. You should carry out the obligatory risk assessments all this other paperwork that's coming with it. I'm sure I know we've all done it, we've all seen it. Um, and we need, of course, to be compliant with governmental guidelines. Um, I guess uh, many countries around the world have similar guidelines. I can, of course, comment, or I know how it is in, um, in the UK where I'm based. Um, and one of the one of the most problematic considerations, of course, is how, we can, how can we ensure social distancing, communication, safe workspaces, and buildings and personal hygiene at a remote working site. Take a look at this photo in the back. That happened pre-COVID, a bunch of 20 geologists being, um, yeah, well, assembling around a drill site, discussing um, rock, rocks and um, you know, mineralization, that's how it should be. 
but how, that's how it cannot be uh, at this stage due to the all the, all the social distancing uh, regulations. So what does this actually mean then for our um, work uh, on remote sites? Well, I guess you can have a choice between two uh, options here. If you have any other options, please uh, let me know uh, on the Q&A. Um, you can either stay at home and not do any field work, but of course we need to drive our field projects forward and we need to be interacting with the rocks, as I like to say, or you can um, think about how you organize the work rotations. And that includes uh, COVID-19 tests, it maybe includes um, social distancing in your camp. It includes um, uh, working out if people want to uh, voluntarily quarantine on a campsite for several months. Um, I'm not sure how well this will go down. Maybe it's required. Maybe you have to uh, uh, bite the bullet, but um, I can imagine um, that if you stay long on the site, it, uh, not everyone will be happy with it, um, especially if uh, you are detached from uh, your social life. All of this has a massive impact on finances, on planning operations. Just think about the amount of money you have to spend on getting all the PPE ready and organizing um, different rotations. So it, it has to be, your, your budget has to sort of either accommodate this or it has to be stretched. Um, it depends on your individual situation. And of course, the planning of operations has really mixed up a lot of projects recently I'm involved with. So um, a lot of work has been um, either made uh, home-based or desktop-based report writing or indeed um, um, you know, people um, quarantining on site. So this is just in a nutshell, a uh, quick, uh, quick comment I wanted to make. I think this can probably be uh, discussed to exhaustion, but I think I leave it there and I recommend you to these um, latest SEG papers uh, that have been published, the Hitzman paper with the employment sort of statistics and the Simon Jowett paper about um, the uh, potential economic impact of COVID-19 on mining. Good, so uh, the last two slides really, uh, before we finish the session off, are about uh, time management. Uh, time management is a very uh, peculiar thing and I'm personally very uh, uh, keen on this. A very simple tool, if you don't know it yet, are Gantt charts. Gantt charts, um, you can use that to list the different activities in Excel and on the horizontal bar, you can list the uh, timeline and you can easily uh, plan out when what activity happens. So this uh, Gantt chart came across my desk uh, a few months ago and I very much liked it. So I thought I am gonna post it here so that you have an idea how a good Gantt chart looks like. It's about an exploration project in uh, northern Finland in the Arctic zone and of course there are some issues with when uh, some field activities can be done. Um, so you can see it's been very neatly uh, split up into uh, preliminary studies, site setup um, and uh, um, uh, reconnaissance and drilling activities and also importantly it includes information on when you have to deliver reports to stakeholders. May that be the, a governmental agency or your uh, exploration manager or um, any other party. So um, I'm sure many of you have seen Gantt charts already, but I thought for those of you who haven't, this is an extremely useful tool when you run projects. And last but not least, uh, budgeting. Um, we talked a lot about finances and budgeting earlier, but uh, many people who enter the industry 
don't have an appreciation for how budgets should look like. So this is just a small excerpt of, of a budget that I've compiled for a project in uh, Southern Africa recently. And it just gives you some split down of costs for geophysics, drilling and analytical cost. Um, so uh, it's important to not just know what is your overall budget, whether that's two or three million US dollars, but actually how you spend the money, in what category this um, um, the finances actually go into. For example, you see that for this particular project, the uh, analytical costs were way higher than any other of these costs in this particular on this particular slide here. So um, knowing the detailed cost can be challenging. I fully appreciate this. But uh, doing your, doing your uh, research beforehand and coming up with all these little items is important. That said, it is, it is often uh, easier to spend your money than to reconcile it later on, right? especially if you have a large team and the money just goes out of your bank account uh, very quickly. Okay, so that's why you have finance personnel who help you to uh, reconcile the costs every um, every month, and then you can uh, check this to your uh, plan forecast and spending. Great. So let me leave this. Uh, or let me show you this uh, very scenic photos in the Argentinian desert here uh, to summarize what we talked about today. So. Um, you should now know more about why logistics is important to the economic geologist, how that affects our daily life and our uh, way of working. Um, we talked extensively about practical considerations that you should almost pick when planning a field program. So uh, once that video is on YouTube, you um, uh, can feel free to uh, use that as a tick box list. And um, we also had a very quick look at um, simple project management tools such as Gantt charts and um, uh, how to draw up budgets in Excel. I think that's it from my side. And um, I noticed that more questions have popped up in the Q&A window. I think we're uh, ready for that now. And uh, let me quickly take a look at some of these Q&As. Great, thanks Benedict. While you take a quick look, um, I just yes. want to acknowledge that we're um, at our hour mark, so I'm not sure if everyone can stay on the call, but just so that folks know, um, you feel free to submit a question using the Q&A uh, box in the bottom of your screen, and Benedict will get to as many as possible, and all of this will be archived on uh, the recording and posted on our website and YouTube channel. So, Great. Um, there are so many questions now that <laughs> it takes me a while to go through. So uh, I apologize if it takes a bit of, if there's a few breaks here. Uh, there's mm -hmm. just one question I see at the moment. In your opinion, where's the next frontier for Greenfields exploration? Yeah, I can tell you that for sure. I think personally that um, there are at least two major areas for greenfield exploration. One is certainly in Russia. And uh, even though um, in the last 50 or 60 years, uh, the Russians have explored uh, a great deal of, of Eastern Siberia, there, is still, there are still areas where uh, the sampling density is quite small. And um, you can easily miss, for example, a vein-hosted mineral deposit. So Russia for one, it's just uh, perhaps uh, you should consider um, some political considerations here. And another one um, that I'm very fond of is uh, Myanmar, um, or it's also known as Burma in Southeast Asia. It is so grassroots or green fields that you can still walk over um, outcropping massive lead sink mineralization. I've done that a few years ago, just outcropping a long strike. So um, those are two of the 
I think the most prominent ones in my opinion, but of course I could argue Africa or Central Australia or parts of Northern Canada are equally frontier. Now let me take a look at some other questions. Yeah, there's a question here referring to the Gantt chart. Um, the question is, you are planning an exploration campaign to look at orogenic gold in Northern Finland with a budget of 3 million euros. Very interesting question. I know that from somewhere. Uh, what would you do? Um, so yeah, of course, uh, uh, that uh, you need to undertake desktop studies. You need to dis uh, check which area you want to go and explore for. Um, whether your project area is uh, um, green fields in terms of it needs to have uh, bottom of till sampling um, or whether it can be drilled straight away because it's a brownfield site. So you need to consider spending money on your quaternary geology studies, on your um, bottom of till sampling, on your um, logistical gear that you need for operating up there. Um, drilling is uh, quite standard, I guess. And um, of course, uh, yeah, so those are a few of the major pointers uh, for you to think about. Okay, let me look at some more questions. A very interesting one. And I think I can answer that partly. Um, the question goes, if the project is successful and moves to the possibility of a mine, how does the exploration team manage the expectations of the local communities at this early stage? That is very tricky. So if you are indeed um, working on a site that has the, that has the potential to move on, um, it needs careful community communication and you should avoid to make promises that you can't keep. And I think, in my opinion, the uh, best way forward is to, from a very early start, uh, establish a sustainable operation. And what do I mean by that? You can consider to employ your local workforce to support the community. So you need to um, uh, gear your community engagement up in a way that it is proportionate to where your, pro to where your project is at the moment. You, and again, you cannot make these uh, promises early on because then expectations are built up over time and um, uh, that may have some, might have some um, um, adverse effects later on. At the end, what do you think? How many more questions do we have time for? I think it's fine to, to take another five, 10 minutes if you're willing to be on the call. Yeah, let's take a look at some more I can, that I can answer. Yeah, um, you've got, uh, there's a, a good question here. In your Gantt chart, there uh, isn't included the exploration permits that the mining companies have to apply for and get the approval. Also, the social cost hasn't been included. Well, the um, exploration permits have been uh, done in this case earlier on. Um, and that's actually not part of uh, this particular um, consideration that I have shown you. The social activities, they can be found later, more down on that Gantt chart. I've just summarized it so that it fits on that page, but you're right that the uh, social activities also and social engagement um, uh, uh, can be on there. Um, for example, um, you know, hosting community barbecues or uh, town hall meetings and so on. Let me check for a few more questions. <laughs> what wild animals have you come across exploring? <laughs> That's a good one. Well, I've... Uh, I've been largely around um, Africa, <clears throat> Europe, and uh, Asia, and now South America. But um, I guess the uh, 
the usuals that you get in Africa are the uh, you know snakes and scorpions. That's what everyone says if you have a, a you know a risk a quick risk assessment or take five. Everyone wants to talk about these um, animal beasts, um, but of course that's uh, something you have to deal with, and you have to know how you uh, behave in a, on, and you act in an accident. Right. Let's move on to the next one. Yeah, another very good question about um, cultural awareness training. In your opinion, how important is it to do some cultural awareness education on a given project region before setting out to work there? Does having a basic appreciation of history and culture of an area help develop your on the ground social resources? Brilliant point, and I agree with you here. Um, it depends on the area you're operating in. Um, in the past, I was working on a number of projects where we had a separate community advisor and this community advisor um, helped us to better understand in a training session what different tribes and uh, cultural communities were around in an area and what the potential conflict zones and uh, conflict aspects were. So uh, knowing about this earlier on um, is, is uh, absolutely essential. Okay, um, of course, that is not that much needed if you're just working um, in your home country and you know exactly every sort of issue that's going on. But if you're overseas, if you're in a remote place, I um, fully support your, your question and your uh, comment here. Let me see, look for another one. Okay, um, one on drilling supplies. How much should you trust drilling companies to bring the supplies they need to operate in remote areas? Obviously, if they have a good track record for operating in these types of areas, you can be more confident. It's very, very um, valid, the comment that you, that you um, in the question that you ask. Um, it depends whether you uh, go for some of the uh, bigger known drilling companies, uh, no, no names given here. Um, those are, of course, always, um, well, I don't want to say always, but uh, most of the time on spot. Um, but nevertheless, you would have meetings with these companies before you actually mobilize into the field. So you go and inspect their drill rigs, you inspect their equipment, you discuss in detail what the geology is that you're expecting so that they can find you in the drill bits. And then you also, of course, mention the supply and the procurement um, chain that is required. Um, so in that way, if you communicate and if you meet the people before you start off, then there, I don't think there should be a major problem. Issues are brought on the table. Okay, maybe one more question. Let's take a look at uh, what we still have. Uh, there was a question which isn't actually a question. Um, yeah, so I think. With that sort of answered, yeah, I think we're through. We, are, we are, had a great outcome of questions. Thank you very much for um, engaging and um, delivering your opinion and um, being um, so interested. I hope that this webinar really was maybe an eye opener for, for uh, how you work, how you can operate on site and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. So I hand the word over to. Yeah, Ryan. and Thank you. Benedict, perhaps if I can ask just one for your a closing thought, if you will, of do you have any advice for the students and early career professionals who um, can't travel right now, what they should be doing to um, help prepare for some of these? Is there 
any advanced work that they can do right now or training or something along those lines? Yeah, I can talk about the advanced work, of course. Um, we all know that there is a physical barrier. So if you want to have a job in Australia, uh, but you can't go there, then it's uh, difficult because they largely hire you uh, if you're out there actually on site or uh, in a major town. But what is the what is the preparation work you can do? Well, first of all, you attend these webinars, which is um, the first step. You can use the time now to gear up on all these uh, educational activities that are going beyond your um, normal education. So your normal lectures or your normal uh, modules that you're doing. I recommend you are um, uh, trying to attend free or you know other training courses that deal with um, questions that are of relevance to the mining industry and if you get a certificate for that as well that would go a, a, a long way you can attach it to your cv and you can show that you've been busy um, during this uh, challenging time at this very moment of course also continue um, uh, sending you applications and being proactive. Um, I mentioned this during one of the previous webinars, which are on YouTube, that uh, you shouldn't just focus on one or two companies. You should really fire out as many applications as you can, um, apply to jobs that are um, um, maybe local to your area, maybe think about uh, doing a temporary job elsewhere. So I know many graduates who um, have gone into, or temporarily have gone into the uh, soil and uh, land contamination route. So like site investigation, shallow drilling, shallow geophysics, and you're still doing a geoscientific job. You learn how to deal with, uh, yes, logistics and drilling. And uh, I think um, if you have the chance to do this in the country you're working in, um, you, um, I think that would prepare you quite well. Great. Thanks, Benedict. And thanks for this presentation. It's been so valuable. Uh, and I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today for the webinar. Um, as a reminder, you, this will be archived and posted on the SCG website and YouTube channel. And we have another webinar coming up. Um, oops, I think I am seeing a little bit of different slides. So please forgive the technical logistics issues here. Um, so we have another webinar coming up on the 27th. That information is on the SEG website. And we also have this upcoming virtual SEG event um, on sediment hosted copper. And it's a four week symposium with pre recorded presentations, which will be released each week. And they will be followed by a live panel discussion with the presenters from the previous week's um, presentations. Um, and this event has been created to celebrate the life of a Copper Belt explorer and educator, James Mowally. Uh, registration opens tomorrow. There is a registration cost, but it's discounted for students, and all of the fees go to the creation of an fund for early career geoscientists in Africa. And once you leave today's webinar, please complete the survey that you will see. We will use that input to help guide our future webinars. And again, quick reminder that there will be an archive of this. And we um, look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you, and that concludes today's webinar.